Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to Lesson 4 from the series on Genesis. It's titled The Flood, ready for teaching on April 23, and my name is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 16. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the interesting stories we've read so far in the book of Genesis. And as we move on this week to see what your word tells us in the stories of the flood, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. May we catch insights this week that will not only enlighten us, but help us with our journey along through life and through our spiritual life too, we pray. We also pray today for those who are listening in Washington State, uh, in the United States, in New Delhi, India, in Caracas, in Venezuela, in Kuwait, uh, Manila, the Philippines, the Gold Coast, Australia, Mauritius, Harare in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh in Scotland, and Santiago in Chile. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will shut us in to your word this week. May we see your love and your grace, and may it become part of our lives, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew chapter 24 and verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Let's read that again, Matthew 24 and verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Genesis 6, 5 reads, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The verb saw in verse 5 here, brings the reader back to each step of God's initial creation. But what God sees now, instead of tov, T-O-V, or good, is ra, R-A, or evil, in Genesis 6, verse 5. It is as if God regretted that he had created the world now full of Ra, as you read in Genesis 6, verses 6 and 7. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And yet, God's regret contains elements of salvation as well. The Hebrew word for sorry, nakham, N-A-K-H-A-M, is echoed in the name of Noah, N-O-A-H-K, in the Hebrew, which means comfort, as you read in Genesis 5.29. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Thus, God's response to this wickedness has two sides. It contains the threat of justice, leading to destruction for some, and yet his response promises comfort and mercy, leading to salvation as well for others. This double voice already was heard with Cain and Abel and Seth, and it was repeated through the contrast between the two lines of Seth, the sons of God, and Cain, the sons of men. Now we hear it again as God differentiates between Noah and the rest of mankind. Sunday, April 17, Preparation for the Flood Read Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, to chapter 7, verse 10. What lesson can we learn from this amazing account of early human history? Genesis 6, beginning at verse 13, And God said to Noah, 
the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, its width fifty cubits, and its height thirty cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And if every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark, to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive." and you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made." And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah and his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass, after seven days, that the waters of the flood were on the earth. Like Daniel, Noah is a prophet who predicts the end of the world. The Hebrew word for the ark, teva, T-E-V-A-H, as used here in Genesis 6.14, is the same rare Egyptian loanword that was used for the ark in which the infant Moses was hidden who was preserved in order to save Israel from Egypt, as we read in Exodus 2, verse 3. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. Also, some have seen in the general structure of the ark parallels to the ark of the tabernacle, as recorded in Exodus 25, verse 10. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. Just as the ark of the flood will permit the survival of humankind, so the ark of the covenant, a sign of God's presence in the midst of his people, as we read in Exodus 25 verse 22, points to God's work of salvation for his people. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. The phrase, Noah did, according to all that God commanded in Genesis 6.22, concludes the preparatory section. The verb asa, A-S-A-H, meaning did, referring to Noah's action, responds to the verb asa, A-S-A-H, make, in God's command, which began the section in chapter 6, verse 14, and is repeated five times in verses 14 to 16. This echo between God's command and Noah's response suggests Noah's absolute obedience to what God had told him to do. 
to Asa, A-S-A-H. It is interesting that this phrase also is used in the context of the building of the Ark of the Covenant, as we read in Exodus 39, verse 32, Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. And verse 42, according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. And Exodus 40 and verse 16, thus Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. So he did. And from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 92, we read, God gave Noah the exact dimensions of the ark and explicit directions in regard to its construction in every particular. Human wisdom could not have devised a structure of so great strength and durability. God was the designer and Noah the master builder. End of quote. Again, the parallel between the two arks reaffirms their common redemptive function. Noah's obedience is thus described as a part of God's plan of salvation. Noah was saved simply because he had that faith to do what God commanded him to do, as you read in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He was an early example of a faith that manifests itself in obedience, the only kind of faith that matters, as you read in James 2.20, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? In short, though Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, as you read in Genesis 6 verse 8, it was in response to this grace already given him that Noah acted faithfully and obediently to God's commands. Isn't that how it should be with all of us? And so to finish the day... Read 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 to 9. Why was only Noah's family saved? What lesson can we learn from the Noah story regarding our role in warning the world about coming judgment? 2 Peter 2, beginning at verse 5, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, beginning in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Monday, April 18, the event of the flood. The verb asa, make, which refers to Noah's actions, also is a key word in the Genesis creation account. As we read in Genesis 1 verse 7, Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And verse 16, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Verse 25, And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That was verses 25 and 26. And verse 31, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning 
were the sixth day. And Genesis 2 verse 2, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Noah's acts of obedience to God are like God's acts of creation. What we can take from this link is that the flood is not just about God punishing humanity, but about God saving us as well. Read Genesis chapter 7. Why does the description of the flood remind us of the creation account? What lessons can we learn from the parallels between the two events? Genesis chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah with his sons, his wife and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creepeth on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of their sons with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those who entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upwards, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. All that were on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth one hundred and fifty days. An attentive reading of the text covering the flood reveals the use of many common words and expressions within the creation story. Seven occurs in Genesis 7, verse 2, 3, 4, and 10. And we read about that in Genesis 2, 1 to 3 as well. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Male and female, we read in Genesis 7, verses 2, 3, 9, and 16. And we compare that with Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. After its kind, we read in Genesis 7, verse 14, and we'll compare that with Genesis 1, 
verse 11 and 12. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And verse 21 so God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And verses 24 and 25, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Beasts, birds, creeping things, we read in Genesis 7 verse 8, and verse 14, and 21 and 23, and we also read about that in Genesis 1, 24 and 25. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And breath of life. We read about that in Genesis 7, verses 15 and 22. And we also read it in Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The flood story reads then somewhat like the creation story. These echoes of the creation account help reveal that the God who creates is the same as the God who destroys, as we read in Deuteronomy 32 verse 39. Now see that I, even I, am He, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. But these echoes also convey a message of hope. The flood is designed to be a new creation out of the waters which leads to a new existence. The movement of water shows that this event of creation is, in fact, reversing the act of creation in Genesis 1. In contrast to Genesis 1, which describes a separation of the waters above from the waters below in Genesis 1 verse 7, the flood involves their reunification as they explode beyond their borders. Genesis 1 verse 7 reads, Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And Genesis 7 and verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. This process conveys a paradoxical message. God has to destroy what is before in order to allow for a new creation afterward. The creation of the new earth requires the destruction of the old one. The event of the flood prefigures the future salvation of the world at the end of time, as we read in Revelation 21 verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And then there's Isaiah 65 verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. And so to finish today, what in us needs to be destroyed in order to be created anew? Romans 6, verses 1 to 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For 
If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Tuesday, April 19, the end of the flood. Genesis chapter 7, verses 22 to 24, describes the overwhelming and comprehensive effect of the waters which destroyed all living things, in verse 23, and prevailed on the earth 150 days, verse 24. It is again this background of total annihilation and hopelessness that God remembered in chapter 8, verse 1. This phrase is situated in the centre of the text covering the flood, an indication that this idea is the central message of the flood story. Read Genesis chapter 8 verse 1. What does it mean that God remembered Noah? Genesis 8 verse 1. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. The verb zakah, Z-A-K-H-A-R, or remember, means that God had not forgotten. It is more than just a mental exercise. In the biblical context, the God who remembers means the fulfilment of his promise and often refers to salvation, as you read in Genesis 19 and verse 29, and it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. In the context of the flood, God remembered means that the waters stopped, as you read in Genesis 2 verse 8. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And that Noah will soon be able to leave the ark, as you read in verse 16. Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives, with you. Though no direct command is yet given to leave, Noah takes the initiative and first finds a raven and then a dove to test the situation. Finally, when the dove does not come back, he understands that the waters were dried up from the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, as you read in verse 13. Noah's behaviour is rich in practical lessons. On one hand, it teaches us to trust God, even though he does not yet directly speak. On the other hand, faith does not deny the value of thinking and testing. Faith does not exclude the duty to think, to seek, and to see if what we learned is true. And yet, Noah goes out only when God finally tells him to do so, as you read in Genesis 8 verses 15 to 19. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. That is, even when he knows it's safe to leave, Noah still relies on God and waits for God's signal before going out of the ark. He waited patiently within the ark, as we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 105. As he had entered at God's command, he waited for special instructions to depart. At last an angel descended from heaven, opened the massive door, and bade the Patriarch and his household go forth upon the earth and take with them every living thing. And so to finish the day... Read Genesis chapter 8 verse 1, Genesis 19:29, and Psalm 106 verse 4. 
What does the expression, God remembers, mean? What does this truth mean for us now? That is, how has God shown you that he remembers you? Genesis 8 verse 1 reads, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. And chapter 19 verse 29, And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. And Psalm 106 verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, with the favour you have toward your people. O visit me with your salvation. Wednesday, April 20, The Covenant, Part 1. Now it was the moment when the promised covenant was to be fulfilled. Genesis 6, verse 18, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. In contrast to the divine threat to destroy in the previous verse, And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. This covenant was the promise of life. Read Genesis chapter 8 verse 20. What did Noah do first when he went out of the ark? And why? Genesis 8 Beginning at verse 20, Then Noah built an ark to the Lord, and took of every clean animal, and of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Like Adam and Eve, who surely worshipped God on Sabbath immediately after the six days of creation, Noah worshipped God immediately after the flood, another creation event in and of itself. There is a difference, however, between the two acts of worship. Unlike Adam and Eve, who worshipped the Lord directly, Noah had to resort to a sacrifice. This is the first mention in the scriptures of an altar. The sacrifice is a burnt offering, or ola, O-L-A-H, the oldest and most frequent sacrifice. For Noah, this sacrifice was a thanksgiving offering, given in order to express his gratefulness to the Creator who had served him. And to compare about the thanksgiving offering, we go to Numbers chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you Come into the land you are to inhabit, which I am giving to you, and you make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice, to fulfill a vow, or as a free will offering, or in your appointed feasts, to make sweet aroma to the Lord from the herd of the flock, then he who presents his offering to the Lord shall bring a grain offering of one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of oil, and one-fourth of a hin of wine, as a drink offering you shall prepare with the burnt offering or the sacrifice for each lamb. Or for a ram you shall prepare as a grain offering two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one third of a hin of oil. And as a drink offering you shall offer one third of a hin of wine as a sweet aroma to the Lord. And when you prepare a young bull as a burnt offering or as a sacrifice to fulfil a vow or as a peace offering to the Lord, then shall be offered with the young bull a grain offering of three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with half a hin of oil. And you shall bring, as the drink offering, half a hin of wine as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Thus it shall be done for each young bull, for each ram, and for each lamb or young goat. Read Genesis chapter 9, verses 2 to 4. How did the flood affect the human diet? What is the principle behind God's restrictions? Genesis 9, beginning at verse 2. 
And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Because of the effect of the flood, plant food was no longer available as it used to be. Therefore, God allowed humans to eat animal flesh. This change of diet generated a change in the relationship between humans and animals, in contrast to what had been between them in the original creation. In the creation account, humans and animals shared the same plant diet and did not threaten each other. In the post-flood world, the killing of animals for food entailed a relationship of fear and dread, as we read there in verse 2, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Once they started eating each other, Humans and animals, no doubt, developed a relationship quite different from what they had enjoyed in Eden. God's tolerance, however, had two restrictions. First, not all the animals were proper for food. The first restriction was implicit in the distinction between clean and unclean animals, which was a part of the creation order, as we read about in Genesis 8, and verses 19 and 20, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went into the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took of every clean animal, and of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And we'll compare that with Genesis chapter 1, verses 21 to 24. Actually, we'll read verses 21 so God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good and verse 24 then God said let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth each according to its kind and it was so. The second one, which was explicit and new, was to abstain from the consumption of blood, for life is in the blood, as we read again in Genesis 9 verse 4. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Thursday, April 21, The Covenant, Part 2. Read Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, to chapter 9, verse 1. What is the significance of God's commitment to the preservation of life? How does God's blessing fulfill that commitment? Genesis 8, beginning at verse 21. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God's commitment to preserve life was an act of grace. It was not a result of human merits. God decided to preserve life on earth in spite of human evil, as we read there in Genesis 8.21. Genesis 8.22 reads literally, All the days of the earth. That is, for as long as this present earth remains, the seasons will come and go and life will be sustained. In short, God has not given up on his creation. 
In fact, the following text, which talks about God's blessing, takes us back to the original creation with its blessing. As we read in Genesis 1, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And Genesis 2, verse 3, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The Lord, in a sense, was giving humanity a chance to start over, to start afresh. Read Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. What is the significance of the rainbow? How does this sign of the covenant in Genesis 9, 13 relate to the other sign of the covenant, the Sabbath? Genesis 9, beginning at verse 8, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living thing that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The phrase establish and covenant is repeated three times in Genesis 9, verse 9, 11, and 17, marking the climax and fulfilment of God's initial promise in Genesis 6, 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives, with you. Following the preceding section, which parallels the sixth day of creation account, this section parallels the section covering the seventh day of creation account, the Sabbath. Inside the text, the repetition seven times of the word covenant resonates with the Sabbath. Like the Sabbath, the rainbow is the sign of the covenant, as we read in Genesis 9, 13, 14, and 16. Let's have a look at that. Verse 9, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And verse 14, It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And verse 16, the rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And then Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 to 17. And that reads, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people." Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. 
Whoever does any work on the Sabbath, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Also, like the Sabbath, the rainbow has a universal scope. It applies to the whole world. Just as the Sabbath as a sign of creation is for everyone, everywhere, the promise that no other worldwide flood will come is for everyone, everywhere, as well. And so to finish today, next time you see a rainbow, think about all of God's promises to us. Why can we trust those promises? And how does the rainbow show us that we can trust them? Friday, April 22. A comparison between the mentality and the behaviour of the people and the state of the world before the flood and that of the people in our days is particularly instructive. To be sure, human wickedness is not a new phenomenon. Look at the parallels between their time and ours, and we have a quote here from Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 101 and 102. The sins that called for vengeance upon the antediluvian world exist today. The fear of God is banished from the hearts of men, and his law is treated with indifference and contempt. The intense worldliness of that generation is equalled by that of the generation now living. God did not condemn the antediluvians for eating and drinking. Their sin consisted in taking these gifts without gratitude to the giver and abasing themselves by indulging appetite without restraint. It was lawful for them to marry. Marriage was in God's order. It was one of the first institutions which he established. He gave special directions concerning this ordinance, clothing it with sanctity and beauty. But these directions were forgotten, and marriage was perverted and made to minister to passion. A similar condition of things exists now. That which is lawful in itself is carried to excess. Fraud and bribery and theft stalk unrebuked in high places and in low. The issues of the press teem with records of murder. The spirit of anarchy is permeating all nations, and the outbreaks that from time to time excite the horror of the world are but indications of the pent-up fires of passion and lawlessness that, having once escaped control, will fill the earth with woe and desolation. The picture which inspiration has given of the antediluvian world represents too truly the condition in which modern society is fast hastening. Even now, in the present century, and in professedly Christian lands, there are crimes daily perpetrated as black and terrible as those for which the old world sinners were destroyed. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, what are the common characteristics of the pre-flood society and ours? What do these common characteristics teach us about God's grace that, despite all this, he loves the world and is still seeking to save whom he can? And two, some people argue that Noah's flood was only a local event. What is wrong with that idea? If this were true, why would every local flood and every rainbow make God a liar? Inside Story our mission story this week is titled Faithful Grandparents, and it's by Andrew McChesney. 
In the evening, after it was too dark to work in the maize field, the Reinecke family gathered around a large kitchen table for supper in their small farmhouse in central South Africa. Father, mother and their seven boys and four girls ate homegrown food every evening. Maize porridge along with potatoes, pumpkin and meat. Afterward, the children cleared away the dishes and father opened his Dutch Bible for family worship. On this particular evening, father opened the Bible to Exodus chapter 20 and read, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Exodus 20 verses 8 to 10. Listen, father said, puzzled. It says here, six days you shall labour, but on the seventh day you shall rest. The idea of resting on the seventh day was new to him. He and his family had always observed the first day, Sunday as the Sabbath, but the Bible said otherwise. Father made a note in the margin of his Bible. Beside the words, six days you shall labour, he wrote, plough time. Beside the words, on the seventh day you shall rest, he wrote, rest time. The matter was clear to him. His family started keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Families took notice on the neighbouring farms, and soon three of them also were keeping the Sabbath. Time passed, and a Seventh-day Adventist literature evangelist stopped by the farm and sold father a little Dutch-language book titled God's Covenant with Man. Through the book, father and mother learned about the Seventh-day Adventist church for the first time. They understood that other people also worshipped on the Seventh-day Sabbath. While there is no historical record of father and mother joining the Seventh-day Adventist Church, four of their eleven children became Adventists. One of their grandsons is Gideon Reinecke, a pastor who helps oversee mission work in South Africa and 14 other countries as Executive Secretary of the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division. Gideon said he owes his Adventist heritage to faithful grandparents who simply read the Bible and obeyed it in the 1920s. We pray that by telling this story from generation to generation, it will yield results and bring more people to Jesus Christ, he said. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help spread the gospel in Gideon Reinecke's home, Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division. Thank you for planning a generous offering. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And it's also on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.